The following programme is for a mature audience and may contain detailed descriptions of violence. Discretion is advised. After the great reign of fire, the known world was changed forever. Glaciers melted, and the frost giants began to retreat up to the highest mountains in the coldest parts of the land, as arctic latitudes were transformed to temperate ones. The country was slowly carpeted with forests, rivers and springs. In this age, the land known today as Karimikos did not border the Sea of Dread, but instead the submerged lands extended many miles to the south, well beyond the present-day archipelagos of Lorendi and Minrathad. The time before the Cataclysm, the ancient writing of Allura Atheri. Date, Night Dane 5, Felmont, AC 1000, Time, 3.10 p.m. Party status, Ilyana, 6 hit points, Yolanda, 7 hit points, Cathbad, 2 hit points. The party are standing outside large ornate double doors leading into the ancient palace of Evandur which lies at the edge of a mysterious forest, deep within Radleb Woods. The doors are far too thick to hear noise beyond. Ilyana pushes them open. They are not stuck, just a little stubborn. But the heavy doors yawn and creak, and open to reveal the entrance hall beyond. Inside the light is dim, shrouding the hall in shadows. The ceilings are about 30 feet high and the thick smooth stone walls are cracked and chipped in many places and covered in vines and creepers. Stay away from the walls, Yolanda says, just as a precaution. The entrance hall is about 20 feet wide and extends about 40 feet ahead to a door, loose, wooden and ornately carved and set in a beautifully sculpted stone arch. Yolanda carefully searches the hallway for traps as the party moves along. She can't find anything out of place or suspicious. The door at the end of the hall is ajar. Yolanda attempts to move silently ahead and take a peek around the door. Through the crack in the door, she can see a large throne room. A thick rug lies at the centre of the room, intricately woven with strange runes. On the far side of the room, a tall throne sits upon a raised platform beyond a short set of steps. Upon the throne sits what appears to be an empty suit of armour. Above the suit of armour on the wall, two crossed swords hang decoratively. Above the room, suspended from the ceiling, is a large crystal chandelier. The room is empty and deadly silent. The party opens the door fully and crosses the threshold, leaving Bella, the mule, waiting in the entrance hall. As soon as they enter, a deep voice echoes from within the armor. Speak the password. It commands. I will roll intelligence checks for the party at this point to see if it's likely that any character might be able to react appropriately to this situation. Ilyana fails, Yolanda and Cathbad succeed. The room's on the carpet, Yolanda points. I think it's elvish. I take you by day, by night you take back. None suffer to have me but do from my lack. What am I? Cathbad says, translating the elven runes. I will roll intelligence checks again to see if any of the characters can figure out the answer to the riddle. Only Cathbad succeeds. He scratches his temple for a moment. As he does this, the two crossed swords suddenly fly off the wall towards the party, and then Cathbad responds. Time, 
The answer is time. The swords suddenly fall from the air and clang lifelessly on the ground, and then the suit of armour, as if also possessed, lifts its right arm, opens its hand, and drops an object on the floor with another clang. It's a key. Yolanda carefully moves towards the key, but as she nears the rug, as though by a gust of wind or a ghost, the rug is lifted from the ground and attempts to smother Yolanda. As it lifts into the air, Ilyana and Cathbad notice a small trapdoor underneath. The characters are not surprised. Initiative rolls. Party 2. Possessed Rug 4. The rug tries to wrap itself around Yolanda and smothers her. It needs a 10 to hit. 11. She must make a saving throw versus paralysis to escape. She needs a 13 to save. She rolls a 16 and saves. She manages to fend off the rug. Yolanda backs up 20 feet towards the door. Cathbad does the same, keeping as much distance as he can. But Ilyana moves forward to engage the rug in single combat. Initiative for round two. The initiative is tied. Yolanda shoots an arrow from a light crossbow she picked up in Riflian. With her dexterity bonus and a further bonus for short range, she needs a 10 to hit. It's 11, rolling 1d6 damage. One damage, barely a thread is cut from the rug. Cathbad throws a dagger. He has a minus two penalty for both dexterity and long range. He needs to roll a 14. 15, with a trembling hand due to his lack of combat experience. He somehow does it. Only one point of damage is caused. Ilyana takes a swing at the rug with her sword. She needs a 10. Five, miss. The rug is trying to smother her at the same time as she lunges forward. And at the same time, the missile attacks come from Cathbad and Yolanda. The rug smothers her. She fails her saving throw. She takes three points of damage. Additionally, as the initiative is simultaneous this round, she will take half the damage caused to the rug while she is in its clutches. So she will take a total of four points of damage, reducing her to just two hit points. She's almost dead. The characters are in a real pickle here. If they attack the rug, they risk hurting Ilyana who will absorb half the damage. If Ilyana can't escape, she will be crushed to death within a few rounds. Stay tuned to find out what happens next. Claudius Tagaris made his way through the dirty, narrow streets of the old quarter in Specularum. As the holy man twisted through the earthen streets, he did his best to avoid the trenches cut into the floor to allow the city's sewage to float by. He did not wear his usual vestments, but in an effort to blend into the crowd, he had adopted the common dress of ankle-length trousers, a belt, and a long-sleeved shirt buttoned at the front. It's him, a sudden voice sounded through the crowded streets. He, he's the one, Claudius turned towards the voice, and as the crowd began to disperse, he saw a Traladaran man in his middle years, given away by his broad belt and colourful sash. He was standing with his wife and two children. The family looked impoverished, their clothes and faces were filthy, and their countenances gaunt. The man gestured to his wife and children. You did this, he accused the cleric. We're half starved, we've nowhere to sleep. 
Claudius was lost for words. His mouth moved, but no speech formed. His moment of hesitation was interrupted by the impact of a rotten apple exploding on his shoulder. Within moments, more rotten fruit, vegetables and mouldy bread was being hurled at him, so he pushed his way through the streets, and he fled in an attempt to lose the angry mob. He wound through back alleys, side streets, pushed his way through the crowds, and ducked into a little doorway. He had wandered into the street of dreams, the prophetic and magical centre of Specularum. To Claudius, this kind of place was abominable. It seems we have a case of mistaken identity. The voice of a young woman spoke from the back of the small shop. It's your younger brother thereafter. What do you know of him? Said Claudius. Cross my palm with silver. The voice responded. In a group game of D&D, characters often want to search for traps, or listen for noise. In solo games, this is a tricky mechanic, especially if, as a dungeon master, you already have an idea of what lies ahead. This is especially problematic if you are trying to run through a pre-published adventure module by yourself. I have my own simple way of handling such situations. In the last episode, I touched on player autonomy and how you can switch your perspective from DM to player to observer, depending on the situation. So with your DM hat on, you will need to determine whether a character will check for traps where there is a possibility of traps. It's important to remember that in a group game, a player would not always remember to check for traps. We can easily tie the chance of making such a check to the character's level. To handle this situation, I roll a d10. The chance of checking for traps is equal to 1, plus the character's level, plus or minus the character's intelligence bonus. A level 1 character without an intelligence bonus has a 2 in 10 chance of checking for traps, and a level 9 character or above will always check for traps. For example, Yolanda is a level 2 thief. She rolls a d10 and has a 4 in 10 chance of checking for traps. 1 plus level plus intelligence bonus. She needs a 1 to 4 on the d10, but she rolls a 5. Yolanda will not check for traps. If Yolanda had rolled a 1, 2, 3 or 4, she would check for traps. The normal procedure in the D&D game rules would then be used to determine whether she manages to find traps. To determine whether a character will listen for noise where there is a possibility of noise, this is much the same as checking for traps. Roll a d10. The chance of listening for noise is equal to 1, plus the character's level, plus or minus the character's intelligence bonus. A level 1 character without an intelligence bonus has a 2 in 10 chance of hearing noise, and a level 9 character or above will always check for noise. To keep the game at a good pace for my listeners, I haven't included these roles in this podcast. Any roles specific to generating the story or deciding how a character behaves are purposely omitted. However, from time to time, I will explain these mechanics to give you an idea of how I do things. If you'd like to know more about how I run my solo games, please visit solodungeoncrawler.blogspot.com or follow me on Twitter at CrawlerSolo. Now, Back to the game.
the characters are engaged in combat with a possessed rug, which is actively crushing and suffocating Ilyana. Initiative for round three. Party five, rug three. Ilyana attempts to make her saving throw. She rolls a 19. She manages to escape the suffocating grasp of the rug. Yolanda tries to shoot the rug with her crossbow again. She rolls a six and misses. Cathbad casts a detect magic spell. All magical objects within 60 feet of him glow. The rug, the suit of armor, the swords lying on the ground and the chandelier in the center of the room above their heads, which he had barely noticed before. Aim for the chandelier, he instructs Ilyana and Ilanda. The rug attempts to smother Ilyana again. It rolls a natural 20. Once again, Ilyana must make a saving throw versus paralysis or succumb to the rug once again. Another natural 20. She gracefully swerves away from the encroaching rug. Initiative for round four. Party six, rug one. Ilyana backs away into the northeast corner of the room next to a large fireplace. Ilyana aims her crossbow at the chandelier and shoots. I will treat the chandelier as AC 10. With bonuses, Yolanda needs a seven to hit. 19. The chandelier comes crashing down. And as soon as it is severed from the ceiling, the glow of magic in the animated object ceases. The chandelier lands on top of the rug and forces it to the ground, pinning it in place, concealing the trapdoor that was discovered underneath. The party rests and gathers their composure. Ilyana tries to move the chandelier. She can't seem to budge it an inch. No movement, no matter how hard she tries. Cathbad and Yolanda join in and finally, they manage to move the chandelier and lift the now lifeless rug out of the way to reveal the small concealed trapdoor. Yolanda checks the trapdoor for traps. It doesn't seem to be trapped. Ilyana lifts the trapdoor open easily, revealing a space beneath the floor with several piles of coins, moss agate gemstones, and two small glass vials containing labeled potions of healing. The potions are labeled with elven script, which Cathbad translates. The party spends a turn carrying the load out to Bella in the entrance hall. They retrieve 2,000 copper pieces, 1,000 silver pieces, 70 gold pieces, and 12 moss agate gemstones worth 10 gold pieces each. Cathbad and Yolanda take a portion of healing each. Yolanda inspects the key dropped by the suit of armor. It's a large, heavy key, which has a half moon engraved onto it and some elven runes. Can you translate this? She asks Cathbad, who walks over to have a look. me Vadriana. It means silver deity of secret night, with pale beams by half I bathe, to enchant me, for I am the key to the garden with the dryad's tree. That door, Ilyana says, as she points to the door on the north wall, ornately carved with the same half moon. Yolanda carefully examines the door for traps. It seems safe. She puts the key in the lock and turns it. Nothing. It doesn't work, she says. With pale beams by half I bathe, Cathbad ponders. Hmm, moonlight, Ilyana says, and Cathbad nods in agreement. Half moonlight, Yolanda corrects. Three days away, says Cathbad. <sighs> Great, says Yolanda. 
the party decides to explore the rest of the palace for the time being, firstly searching the throne room for anything of interest. They search large fireplaces on the east and west walls, but they find nothing of interest. There are doors to the east and west of the room. The party will try the east door first. Yolanda checks the door for traps. Ilyena proceeds to open the door, but as soon as she does, a strong gust of wind comes from the other side of the door, pushing the characters back and tearing the door from its hinges. They must succeed on strength checks to withstand the battering wind. I'm going to take a moment to pause here. If you're familiar with later editions of D&D, you might be wondering why I'm about to roll an ability check instead of a saving throw. The simple answer is that saving throws tied to ability scores don't really exist in BECMI D&D, so I'm using ability checks instead. To perform an ability check, a character rolls 1d20 against the pertinent ability score. If they roll equal to or less than their score, they succeed in the ability check. If they roll higher than their score, they fail. As an alternative, you could opt to use the character's saving throws. Situations that require strength could be replaced with a saving throw versus paralysis and dexterity with a saving throw versus wands, for example. But I think this approach is a little confusing. With that cleared up, let's get back to the game. Rolling strength checks for the party. They all fail and are pushed back 10 feet and must now perform a dexterity check to stay on their feet. Kafbad manages to sturdy himself with his cane, but Ilyena and Yolanda fall prone and will both take a single hit point of damage. Yolanda is reduced to six hit points, Ilyena is reduced to one. Yolanda offers Ilyena her healing potion. As they lay pinned to the floor, she does her best to pull it out of her backpack and attempts to reach for Ilyena, who is close enough to grab the potion from her. Yolanda will need to succeed on a strength check to keep hold of the potion. She also succeeds. She drinks. She gains five hit points. She's now back to her maximum of six. They are not ready to give up. They face the wind once more. Ilyena and Yolanda must make another strength check to stand up. And if they do, the wind will reduce their movement speed to half, and each turn spent moving, the characters will need to perform a further strength check or be pushed back 10 feet. When they are pushed back, they will need to make a dexterity check or fall prone and take further damage. Will the characters overcome the battering winds? Or are they fighting a losing battle? What is the strange half moon engraving on the key? Will they survive long enough to uncover its mysteries? Find out next time. You have been listening to Tales of Mistara. I sincerely hope you have enjoyed this episode. Stick around. I will read out some listener correspondence. If you would like to send a small donation to show your appreciation and help support this show so it can continue to grow and expand, then please visit paypal.me forward slash Tom DND. In this episode, I'd like to thank Raphael Brinner for their kind donation in July. Thank you so much. If you have listened on YouTube, please give this video a like. Feel free to add a comment to let me know your thoughts. If you don't want to miss a future video, then make sure you subscribe. 
and click the bell icon to receive a notification when I upload a new one. If you have listened using a podcatcher, such as Apple or Google Podcasts, Podbean, Amazon or Audible, then I'd appreciate it if you would leave a five-star review. These things really help, and they let me know that the work I put into the show is worth it, and that I'm making content that people like. After all, that's why I'm doing this. Another way you can support this show is by sharing it with your friends or followers on social media. Recommendations go a long way in bringing in new listeners and ensuring the continuation of the show. Now for some listener correspondence. Ned Leeds left the following comment on YouTube. Pleasant surprise to see a new season. No spoilers. But I was surprised to see the continuity. I recently started a pen and paper campaign, late last year, also set in Mistara and using BECMI. I actually set the starting point for my PCs 10 years after the events depicted in your podcast putting them on the road to Threshold, through Verge, and meeting Yolanda and Ilyana, who had retired as owners of the inn. I hope they live to retire. Thanks, Ned. I hope that Ilyana and Yolanda's next 10 years will make sense in the context of your world. I'd be interested to hear about how they are getting on at the inn. Mytheoron on Audible said, I've been listening to this on YouTube, and it's great to find out it's also available on Audible, so I can listen to it on the go. Great to see, or hear, the red D&D rules being used. This uses the BECMI set, which is still the best rule set. 5e doesn't come close. The story presented here is engaging, and keeps you listening, really in depth for a solo experience. Thanks, Mytheron. I'm also a huge fan of BECMI and enjoy it more than 5e. Appreciate the kind words and hope you enjoy this season. Thanks for those comments. Keep them coming. I'll pick out a few each episode. Every comment you leave, positive review, like, subscription or recommendation makes a difference. It ultimately keeps this alive and I really appreciate it. Have a great week everyone. Thanks for listening, and as always, see you next session.